25 years, a quarter of a century, 9,125 days. No, it's not how long the Trump administration has been in power, although it feels like it. It's the amount of time the average American spends asleep, a third of our lives. There we lie, while all around us the world keeps on grinding away and the stars whirl across the heavens. Thornton Wilder wrote about it in his play, Our Town. There are the stars, he wrote, doing their old, old crisscross journeys in the sky. Scholars haven't settled the matter yet, but they seem to think there are no living beings up there, just chalk or fire. Only this one is straining away, straining away all the time to make something of itself. The strain's so bad, every 16 hours, everybody lies down and takes a rest. I've mostly been a pretty good sleeper during my 60 years on Earth. There were a few nights that kept me up with worry, like when my parents were sick. There were a few nights that kept me up with happiness, like when my children were born. And there were even a few nights I stayed up right until the time the sun came up because I was so full of life that I couldn't bear to let go of it, even for the few hours it would take me to close my eyes and rest. It was like that on one of the first dates I ever had with my wife, Didi, over 30 years ago, when we decided that we'd hang out in this bar in the West Village until it closed, and then we'd walk all the way over to the Brooklyn Bridge and stand there beneath the stars and slow dance, not because we loved the night, but because we loved each other, and all we wanted to do was to spend every hour awake and in each other's arms. Like I said, I've mostly been a good sleeper, but when I was young, when I was really young, there were times when I would lie awake at night sometimes, unable to sleep, not because I was so happy, but because the world I lived in just so completely mystified me that I couldn't let it go at the end of the day. And there I would lie with my mind spinning around and around as I wondered, what is this world? Who am I? What's going to happen to me? As a young transgender person, that happened to me a lot. I'd lie there in my boy's body and think, What's wrong with me? Why do I feel the way I feel? Why, since the earliest moment I remember, have I felt like a girl? Sometimes I would have a conversation with God. What do you want from me, I would ask. Is the mission of my life really going to be to change gender, to do a thing I know no one else will understand? Dear Lord, if you are going to give me a superpower, I would think, why couldn't have been something more practical, like x-ray vision, or, I don't know, maybe super strength? In June of 1969, I lay in a bunk in Tuscarora Cabin in the Iroquois village of Camp Beckett in Beckett, Massachusetts, a boys' camp that my parents had sent me to in hopes that a whole summer of playing tetherball and making lanyards out of gimp might be through some miracle, make me more like the children of some of their friends. Instead, it just made clear to me how different I was from all these other boys, how I would never be among their number. And so, I crept out of bed and went outside and stared up at the heavens. It was the moon landing summer, and it was impossible not to look up into the night sky that June without imagining the tiny craft that was just about to sail away from the gravitational pull of Earth, preparing to land on that mysterious world just beyond our reach. I did not know it at the time, but the world in which I lived had changed that month in a bar 
150 miles to the south. This, of course, was the Stonewall Inn where 50 years ago this week in several nights of protest and violence, queer people fought back against police who had raided the bar. Stones and bottles and garbage cans were thrown. The windows of the Stonewall were broken. A parking meter was used as a battering ram. Cops pulled out their nightsticks and protesters formed a kick line like the Rockettes and sang at the cops who threatened them with violence. One woman who was there at some point that night was Marsha P. Johnson. She used to say, the P stands for pay it no mind. In one account of that night, Ms. Johnson stood atop the bar and hurled a shot glass at a mirror on the wall and shouted, I got my civil rights. She later called it the shot glass heard round the world. Well, that shot glass may have been heard around the world, but it took a long, long time, years in fact, for the sound to reach me. In fact, it had still not yet reached me eight years later when, as a first-year student at Wesleyan University in Middletown, Connecticut, I lay in my dormitory bed on a Saturday night, staring at the ceiling, still wondering, what is this world? What is this life? What's going to happen to me if I don't stop needing to be a woman? And so, once again, I got out of bed and took a walk. It wasn't that late, in fact. I remember the winter stars shining down, Orion and the Herdsman and the Northern Crown. Wesleyan had a little concert space called the World Music Hall, where they hosted performances by musicians from around the world, Javanese gamelan orchestras, African drummers, tabla and sitar players from North India, and that night, I stumbled into the end of a concert by a Scottish folk singer named Jean Redpath. She was standing center stage as I came in, and she was singing a beautiful song. My life flows on in endless song Above earth's lamentation I hear the real, though far off him, that hails a new creation. Through all the tumult and the strife, I hear its music ringing. It sounds an echo in my soul. How can I keep from singing? Riverside, can you help me out with that when I say, How can I keep from singing? I still remember standing there, hearing that beautiful voice in that beautiful space, tears rolling down my face. My heart was so clenched up and troubled with the impossibility of what I thought I'd been called upon to do. I had felt so alone, like I was the only person in the world who'd ever suffered with the thing that was slowly, slowly eating away at me. And yet, in spite of all of that, there was this music ringing away. It sounded an echo in my soul. How could I keep from singing? Well, the world kept spinning around and around, and the stars kept whirling over my head at night. On New Year's Eve 2000, I stood by the shores of a cold lake in Belgrade, Maine, with my six-year-old son in my arms and my wife, Dee Dee, at my side. I'd still not spoken the thing that was in my heart out loud, but somehow I knew the time was coming. Maybe in this new millennium, I might find my courage. Maybe at long last, I might find the answer to the questions that had always plagued me. 
what is this world? What is this life? Finally, a year later, I sat down with my 84-year-old Republican mother to tell her I was transgender. A born-again Christian, an evangelical, a conservative, I was fairly certain that the news that her child was coming out as trans was not going to strike her as the greatest thing that had ever happened to her family. So I poured her out about the strongest gin and tonic I'd ever made for anyone, and I sat down and I spilled the beans at long last about the thing that had been in my heart since I was a child. I said, Mom, I'm sorry I never told you this before, but I was afraid that if I told you the truth about who I was, that you wouldn't love me anymore. And then I started to cry, and the tears just rolled down my face and hung there at the bottom of my chin. And that is when my 84-year-old mother, five feet tall, got up out of her chair and sat down next to six-foot-tall me and put her arms around me and said, I would never turn my back on my child. I will always love you, no matter what. And then she quoted 1 Corinthians. She said, and now these three remain, faith, hope, and love but the greatest of these is love. I said, okay, mom, but seriously, when everyone finds out that I'm your daughter now, won't that be an embarrassment? Kind of like a scandal? And she said, well, quite frankly, yes. <laughs> and then she said, but I will adjust. And then she wiped the tears off my face and she said, love will prevail. There have been many moments over the course of my life where I doubted God when I looked up at the sky and wondered, hello, <laughs> are you there? Is it possible I'm really all alone down here? But in that moment, I knew that I was not alone and that if God is anything, God is love. Surely it is in the radical ways we can open our hearts to each other on earth that we make our most profound connection to the eternal. In that same play I mentioned earlier, Our Town by Thornton Wilder, he says, we all know that something is eternal and it ain't houses, and it ain't names, and it ain't earth, and it ain't even the stars. Everybody knows in their bones that something is eternal, and that something has to do with human beings. There's something way down deep that's eternal about every human being. Surely, that eternal thing way down deep in every human heart is love. Later, when I came out to my wife, Deirdre, I can assure you that she also thought something like, well, this is not the first thing I thought of when I wondered about how I could improve my marriage. <laughs> we cried a lot of tears, tried to figure out what it would mean for us as a couple if we stayed together. I can tell you that in some ways, we're still figuring it out. But I can also say that we've now been married for 30 years actually 31 this Tuesday, <laughs> 12 as husband and wife, and 18 as wife and wife. In most of the ways that matter, we are still our same selves. Our hearts still incline toward each other, as is their habit. That was nearly 20 years ago. And since that time, there's been great forward movement for LGBTQ people. There's been great progress in treating and controlling HIV, marriage equality, in spite of everything certain people threw in its way, is now the law of the land. 
more people than ever have found the courage to come out and be known, to be celebrated for the love in their hearts and the truth of who they are. And yet, for the last three years now, Donald Trump and Mike Pence have done everything they can do to undo decades of progress. Within two hours of being sworn in, they removed all mention of LGBTQ people from the official White House website. The Justice Department has argued that it's legal to fire workers for being gay. You can get married on a Sunday and fired on a Monday. They supported the baker in the Masterpiece Cake case, making it legal for businesses to refuse to serve people because of who they are. They've succeeded in banning transgender people from the military, people who, unlike this president, volunteered to lay down their lives for this country. Here's a new one. Just two weeks ago, they argued that now we can be thrown out of homeless shelters. Homeless shelters. They're trying to change the census so that LGBTQ people are not counted, because of course, if we're not counted, we don't exist. And they've formulated plans to erase transgender people entirely as a legal class. As Randy Newman once sang, they're trying to wash us away. They're trying to wash us away. But we cannot be washed away. We are here. We will stay as part of this country because, as my mother said, love will prevail. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. And I appointed you to go and bear fruit, fruit that will last so that the Father will give you whatever you ask him in my name. I'm giving you these commands so that you may love one another. Mr. Trump, you cannot erase human love. You cannot erase human dignity. In the end, what will be erased, Mr. Trump, is you. And all of your sad attempts to turn back the clock. When tyrants tremble, sick with fear, and hear their death knell ringing. When friends rejoice, both far and near, how can I keep from singing? When I was a child, staring up at that big yellow moon, that stonewall summer, I felt so alone because I did not know that I belonged to God, that I belonged to the world, that I belonged to a community of people who would embrace me when I finally spoke my truth. What was this world? What was this life? Now, 50 years later, now that I am no longer asleep, I know the answer. It's a place where love will prevail a place where the radical transformative power of compassion and forgiveness will erase hatred, destroy tyrants, restore and heal the earth. No storm can shake my inmost calm while to that rock I'm clinging. Since Lord is, I messed up the last line, didn't I? I'm going to try it again. Since love is Lord of heaven and earth, how can I keep from singing? There is so much work ahead, so much hate to undo. In the midst of this terrible storm, with all the abundant love inside us, how can any of us, gay, straight, trans, cis, human, how can any of us, how can we keep from singing? How 
can we keep from singing? Amen.